and stuff. Yes. We've got Darth Vader standing up in one corner at the far end. I know Goliath's up there as well somewhere. There's somewhere the and there's a, there's, a, there's a good arsenal of um, assorted weapons, so... You're very creative. <laughs> I'll make a lot of, a lot of mess. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll start with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for bringing us together today. Lord, we pray that you will, you will feed us with the word of your word. Lord, that you will fill us to overflowing. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Now, if you look at your notes, there's a, an unusual object on the top that looks rather dubious. They have some debate on the subject. That's the only picture I can find of a wine skin. Uh, there's lots of there's lots like a um, like a modern water bottle type affair, mm -hmm. but that's what it was in a museum somewhere. I think it's a goat skin. Um, it might look a bit like a pig, in which case it's not very Jewish. But one way or the other, that is an old wine skin. And with those words, if you'd like to go to Matthew for me, please. Matthew 9. This is Jesus speaking, and he's talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees, if Jesus had come along to endorse Pharisaism, and to help them what they call build, build the, fill in the gaps in the walls of their, their regulations, they would have accepted him. Yeah. But he didn't. And this is Jesus' reply. So it's verse 16. But no one puts a patch of unshrunken cloth in an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. Nor do men put new wine in old wineskins. Otherwise the wineskin will burst, the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine in fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. Mm -hmm. This is talking about, effectively, the new, well, not a new religion as such, but the new phase of God's plan. So what Jesus is talking about here is, effectively, there's a new phase in what could be called the kingdom program. It's probably the best way of putting it, the, the king, God's kingdom on earth. God's changing things and he's starting something new. And he's not going to try to hook, hook, crowbar Christianity into Judaism. No. He's not here to fix Judaism. I say fix Judaism. That's not Old Testament Judaism. That's Pharisaical Judaism. He's not interested in Pharisaical Judaism. So this is something new. And this particular section we're going to look at today is going to show you how the, this new religion sort of like new wine, bubbles and stretches and has to elbow itself out. So an old wine skin, which has gone brittle, if you did that, it would split. So you need a new wine skin that can stretch and change as new problems arise. So that's what we're looking at today. If we quickly go to Acts 2, this is the verse we've been doing for the last two weeks and we'll still be doing it for another week after this. Two sessions, sessions, sorry. If I had to do this every week, I'd be in trouble. So this is the one verse we've been doing, verse 42. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, done that, to fellowship, did that last time, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Now we're doing the breaking of bread this time. And what I want to show you is how the church has to adapt and move and how things change. And it's all about this particular subject here. I mean, it happens in all different areas of the church, but in this particular issue here. That term of breaking of bread, what does that bring to your mind? Communion. 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 So you're all thinking communion. So they're having communion at all, all the houses. Okay, there's only one other time this is used. This particular word is used. It's used by Luke. Go to, go to um, Luke 24. The road to Emmaus. You know the story well. And it's verse uh, 28 to 31. And so Jesus has joined these two people as they're, uh, they're leaving Jerusalem. They're going to, to Emmaus. And he's been giving them a good long Bible study on the way. And they don't recognise him. And as they approached the village where they were going, he acted as though he would go on further. And they urged him to stay and stay with us. 
for it is getting towards evening, and the day is now nearly over. And they went to stay, uh, and he went to stay with them. And it came about while he was reclining at table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and began giving to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. Was that communion? That was a meal. That was a meal. They were having a meal. Now, the, why did they not recognise Jesus by his words? Why did they not recognise Jesus by his face? Why did they recognise Jesus by the breaking of bread? Firstly, the Holy Spirit was blind in their eyes. But there's a reason. Go to Mark chapter 6. Many moons ago, I did um, the feeding of the 5,000. I think it's the second session we ever did in Deacon Deeper. And this is something I pointed out that the Mark says. So Mark 6 and it's 33. 33 to 44. And the people saw them going and many recognised them and ran together on foot um, from all the cities and they got there ahead of them. And when he got to shore, he saw a great multitude and he felt compassion for them. That's an important thing to keep in your mind. He felt compassion for them. And they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began teaching them many things. And when it was already quite late, the disciples came to him, began saying to him, this place is desolate. Um, and it's just already quite late. Send them away so that they may go to the surrounding countryside to buy for themselves something to eat. And he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. One of the other Gospels said, unless, don't send them away unless they faint on the way. Yes. Um, anyway, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and shall give them something to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. And they found and they said, five, two fishes and a packet of bourbons. <laughs> <laughs> and he commanded them all to recline on the ground. Um, on the green grass and they reclined in companies of, of hundreds and fifties and he took the, lo the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven he blessed the food he broke the loaves and he kept giving it to the disciples to set before and he divided up the two fish also do you have the word and he kept dividing up there? No, I don't know. Kept. Well, well, I'm it for some reason yeah. he kept, it. He kept yeah. dividing and what that means is, I remember the film, um, there was a film with um, Robert Powell as Jesus a long time ago. Um, and he breaks the bread, puts it in a basket, an extra walks in front, and suddenly the basket's full of food. <laughs> but that's not how it happened. Jesus yeah. broke, put it in, broke, put it in, broke. Yeah. They took up 12 full baskets of leftovers. Mm -hmm. Imagine how long it took for Jesus to break, break. And the disciples were standing there watching him. This isn't like some street ma magician who does a quick thing that's done. Imagine raising someone from the dead. Boom! Raised from the dead. Boom! How did that happen? I don't know. But then you're watching. Break. 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 How's that happening? And that's the reason this miracle is the only miracle apart from the resurrection in all four Gospels. The feeding of the 5,000. And so, whether these two disciples were there on this occasion, or whether they had been with Jesus um, when he was preached, because Jesus would have broken the bread at the beginning of every meal. It's a traditional Jewish thing at the beginning of the meal. Um, when I went to Israel, they, they pour salt over the bread to purify it, and then they break it. You can't use a knife on bread because that's disrespectful to the bread. You have to break it. So Jesus obviously had some set way which he would do it. All the disciples were used to that. So that's why when the, the two disciples in Emmaus see Jesus break the bread, nobody else does it like that. But that's how they recognised him. <clears throat> but that was a normal meal. That wasn't communion. So when they miss in their groups in Acts, yeah. oh, I assume they were taking communion together. So we'll, fi we'll find out. That's where, we're going, that's where we're going today. Um, now, our high church brethren would obviously see this breaking of bread as the Eucharist, as communion, and they would see it as that. And to be honest, they've got something to back them up. If you go to John 6, 
This is what Jesus' sermon after the feeding of the 5,000. He's in the synagogue at Capernaum. The crowds are coming after him. They, they, want, they want more food, please. They want more miracles. And when you read this, our high church brethren's view of this seems to come, yes, it's correct, they must have been having communion. And they would see probably the whole of the feeding of the 5,000 as a form of communion, form of Eucharist. Um, go to 41. <clears throat> so this is Jesus speaking to the, the crowd, speaking to the Pharisees. Um, where John says the Jews, it usually means the religious Jews, the sort of the more upper class type people. The Jews therefore were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that come down out of heaven. And they were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Not that any man has seen the father except the one who has come from God. He has seen the father. Truly I say unto you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread also which I shall give for, um, for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews therefore began to argue amongst each other, saying, How can this man give, him, give us his flesh to eat? Start with, it's not kosher. <laughs> Jesus therefore said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. He who eats his flesh and drink, or eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the, li as the living Father sent me, I live because the Father, um, and I live because the Father, so, so he who eats me, he shall, have, shall, he shall live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as your fathers ate and died. He who eats bread shall live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult statement, who can listen? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled, said unto them, Does this cause you to stumble? What then if you should see, behold, the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? This is the important verse. It is spirit. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I spoke to you are spirit and are life. Now our high church brethren would read the first bit there and probably stop at that verse. Mm. Because what Jesus says, what, 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 that allegory I've just used is a spiritual allegory. Our high church brethren would literally take the piece of bread. Um, I had to go um, to an interview with one of the ministers once at one of the, or priests I should say, one of the churches, high church. He has oh, Eucharist every single day. And one day of the week he actually spends half an hour praying before the, the host, the piece of bread, which they believe turns into Jesus. So he would sit there and contemplate and um, sit there in adoration before the host. And so they literally believe that the bread and the wine become the body and the blood of Jesus, even in the C of E. In fact, some of them are higher than the Catholics. Um, but here's Jesus saying this, what I'm just telling you, which sounds like it, it sounds it's spiritual. Like, yes, yeah. it sounds like he is saying this is mine. Yeah, yeah. He is, in, in some ways he is saying that. But he's not saying it about the bread that they've just eaten. He's not even saying it about the manna in the wilderness. One of the things we're looking at here is the, the spiritual aspect of breaking the bread and the physical aspect of breaking the bread and we can see how it affects the church and how this wineskin had to stretch 
around to face it. Let's go to the Last Supper. This is really, go to Mark, Mark 14. This is where, where what we think of as the of communion first starts. While they were eating, he took some bread and after he had blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take this, this is my body. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I shall never drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. Once again, our high church brethren go, game, set and match. Thank you very much. Except the Passover meal was an entirely symbolic meal. And the bread he took was symbolic. It was called the Afikoma. It was a piece of um, mozza that had been hidden at the beginning of the meal. They broke it in half, they wrapped it up in cloths and they hid it somewhere. And at this point in the meal, the youngest people would go around and they would try to find it like a game. They would bring it to the host and he would break it up and pass it out. And it was supposed to be the last thing, last food they ate was supposed to be the afikoma. The afikoma means afters, by the way. Wow. So the last thing you eat is not your um, Black Forest ghetto or cream cakes <laughs> or whatever. It's a bit of mozza. So you went out of the building with that taste in your mouth. And the wine that they drank um, was representing the blood of the lamb. So Jesus here is changing the, the symbology of this symbolic meal. This thing, this bit of bread that was broken, hidden, brought back, and is now shared out. When you do that, remember me. When you drink this wine, remember my blood, remember me dying. So there's a symbolic meaning to the meal which Jesus brings in. Now the question is, Every time they met together, did they immediately start doing a communion supper like this? Did they do a Passover meal every single time? Yeah. Mm. Because obviously the two people who went to Emmaus, they weren't eating the Passover again, they were just having a normal meal. Yeah. But there usually would be bread and wine. Yeah, there would be bread and wine there. Yeah. But Jesus is bringing this particular aspect in here. Let's go to see Melchizedek. Back to Genesis. Someone that our high church brethren again are very fond of. A priestly king who comes out with wine and bread for Abraham. And I think they, um, some of them see themselves as priests after the order of Melchizedek. So Genesis 14 and it's um, 17 to 18. A bit of background to this, there's been the first war recorded in the Bible. There's four kings that have attacked all the local cities, they've wiped them out, including Sodom and Gomorrah. In Sodom, as we know, Lot was staying, and they take Lot captive. So Abraham gets his household together, another Bedouin tribe, there's about four or five hundred men. They travel through the night, um, they attack these four kingdoms at night and beat them up. And then they're heading back and they're bringing back thousands of prisoners as well. So released prisoners who they've released who have been taken captive. So that's the, um, uh, the background to this. Then after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer, whatever his name, and the kings that were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet, um, meet him at the valley of Shevar, that is the valley, um, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem brought, brought out wine, a bread and wine, for he was priest of the God Most High. And he blessed him and said, blessed, and, uh, blessed be Abraham of God Most High, professor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. To give, and, he gave, and Abraham gave him a tenth of all. Imagine, here comes these people who have been in a battle. Here come these prisoners and they're coming up. And along comes this priestly king, have a little bit of bread and a little sip of wine each. Do you think the Bible would have remembered him quite as fondly? He brought carloads down. Basically, he got, he got all the people, right, get as much bread, much wine, get much food. These people have been in a the battle, there's prisoners coming up. 
let's get down here with all this stuff. So that's what, when they said bought bread and wine, that's what he was bringing out. It was tons of stuff. He was feeding the, the hungry. That's what he was doing. And that's why he's praised in the Bible. He didn't need to do that, but he did it off his own back. Because Jerusalem was well away from all these other places. He was nowhere near it. He came down with as much stuff as he can for, this, for these refugees, for Abraham. And he celebrated and he prayed. So that's why Melchizedek is remembered well in the Bible. Now to give you an idea of this, go to uh, Genesis 18, a little while longer on. <laughs> now this is, the, the law of hospitality is very important in the Bible. Even in the New Testament, the law of hospitality is important. <coughs> if strangers come along, um, you're supposed to give them hospitality, you're supposed to look after them, you're supposed to feed them. And here's Abraham following the rules. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. Now this is written in retrospect, he probably didn't know it was the Lord at the beginning. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them he ran from his tent door. He's, he's 98 years old at this stage. <laughs> he ran from his tent, he's doing quite well. Um, and he, to meet them he bowed himself to the earth. When I go down to the earth, it takes me quite some time to get up afterwards. But anyway. <laughs> and he said, my Lord, if I have now found favour in your sight, please do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought to you and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. And I will bring you a piece of bread. Does yours say a piece of bread? I've got some food. I've got some food. Some food. Yeah, I've got a little piece of bread in my one that you may refresh yourself. And after that, go on, since you have visited your servant. And they said, yes, or so, um, so do as you have said. Abraham quickly hurried to the tent to Sarah and said, quickly, prepare three measures of fine flour, knead it and make bread cakes. Abraham also ran and took a, a tender choice of calf and gave it to his serpent, serpents to have, prepare it. And he took curds and milk and the calf that they had prepared and placed it before them and he was standing under the tree while they ate. And if you've got a, well it says three measures of fine flour, do you, uh, any notes to that? Yes. Say how much it is? 16 kilos. 16 kilos of flour. Oh. I've got um, tw uh, 20 litres of flour. A piece of bread. Wow. 20, <laughs> 16 <laughs> kilos of bread. <laughs> and the fatted calf. <laughs> and the afters. So this is what the laws of hospitality, that's what Melchizedek was doing. He, he was bringing down as much as he could for these people. He was bringing, this is how it worked. And if you think of the Passover meal, we won't look up the first Passover, but they had a whole lamb between a family. Can you imagine trying to eat, I mean, not just a little bit of a, a lamb leg, but a whole lamb. And they had, um, um, they had bread, they had herbs, they had, the, these were big meals. These weren't a little thing. Often in the Bible, to let you understand a word, you need to see where it's first used in the Bible. Where's the first time bread is mentioned in the Bible? It's right in front of you, actually. But. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Go to Genesis 3. Somewhere you probably won't recognise. Now, you can tell that I go a lot to Genesis, because there's the first three chapters of Genesis. They've fallen out. <laughs> Genesis 3. And it's 17 to 19. It's an unusual place, and you probably, you've read it a thousand times, and you've probably not realised it. Uh, then to add, this is God speaking after the fall. And then to Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall grow for you, and you shall plant, uh, and you shall eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, and from dust uh, you are from dust, and to dust you shall return. <coughs> you haven't got bread. You've got food. That's interesting because that's the same word for bread, the word that's used throughout the Old Testament for bread. So it also means sustenance. 
But literally, it is the word that they use for bread everywhere else. Mm. So now, we're all automatically thinking, well, sustenance makes more, food will make more sense because they didn't have bread in the Garden of Eden, did they? Or did they? I don't know. Have they taken the, the, the grains and ground them up and turned them into bread? No, no. Well, you can eat them as grain. You can yeah. just eat them as grain. Yeah. But this is whether they had bread there or not. It's the same word that the Bible uses all the way through. Now, the principle here is the same. It takes a lot to get food. It's no longer a freebie. You have to work at it. So it's <laughs> nobody's going to give it to you for free. You have to do something for it. Um, whether you're sitting in front of a computer typing all days or ploughing <coughs> in the field, whatever it is, you have to work at it. Um, with that in mind, turn to uh, Samuel. To Samuel. <coughs> now how do most of us cope? How do most of us work? If you're on your own, it's hard work. So how, what do we do? We get together. Yeah. We marry. We make up a team. We make up a household. Just doing it all on... Can you imagine poor um, Ruth in the fields when she was collecting the wheat? She had to go and collect the wheat. Then she had to beat it herself. Collect it all up. Then she had to take it and grind it all herself. Then she had to go and collect the firewood and cook it and knead it. So can you imagine the, the entire work of that? Whereas what most people do, they, they get into a household, they get into a group and they start breaking down the jobs and they all work together to make something. So what I'm going to start to bring the idea here is, is working together in a household. So if we go to Samuel and it was uh, seven, somebody else want to read this one for me please, I've been reading too much so far. Uh, uh, 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 13. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Hmm, what's that to do with anything? I will build a house for you. So who are you thinking, who built, who was the son of, uh, son of David that built a house? Solomon. Who's another son of David who's building a house? Jesus. Jesus. Good Sunday school answer, correct. <laughs> Go to Timothy. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. There's a couple here that um, Paul's teaching, and we'll see Paul's starting to get an idea here of, of a family, of a household. So 1 Timothy 3. 14 to 15. Someone like to read this one for me? Oh, I'll read it. Okay. <laughs> These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to, to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And I'll finish, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. That's it, that's right. That's interesting. You've just got the word church there. Yes. Fine. Or the word, the word house. Conduct this yourself in the, ha the house. James. Okay. Anybody else got a different word from there instead of house? Household. 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 Home of, home of God, did you Homes. Homes. So there's an idea coming in. If we go and check another one, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. So you are no longer, no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole, the whole buildings being lifted together is growing into the holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Holy Spirit. Got a household there as well? What have you got that one? Yes, yeah, so it's in verse 19. God's household. 
Ja, Herz. Ja. Now the idea is here, you're having to work at something to feed everybody. God is actually building a household. The son, of, the son of David was promised that he would build a house, and we're not talking bricks and mortar here, we're not talking the temple. As Christians, last time we talked about being part of the body, we're part of the body of Christ. Here, it's now talking about you're part of the household. Houses work together. Sarah does all the hard work, I sit in the corner and um, <laughs> read the newspaper and... <laughs> okay. You sit in the corner but we... Everybody in a household has different jobs. They work together to make it work. And now as a church, we are a household working together. And the bread, that we have to work hard to do it and feed each other, we're working together to do that. Now, having thought of that, let's go back to Acts. And um, there's two sections in Acts we're going to read. And think of the idea of a household coming together. God creating a household. So we're going to Acts 2, 42. 42 to 47. So we've read this one already. And they were continually devoting themselves to the gospel, or to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place by the apostles. All of those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and their possessions and were sharing it with all, as anyone might have need. And day to day, continually, they were in one mind in the temple and were breaking bread from house to house. And they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord was adding to them day by day those who were being saved. And we have another parallel passage a little bit further on, Acts 4. A bit more detail in this. It's 32. And the congregation of those believed were of one heart and soul, and no one of them claimed that anything that belonged to him was his own, and that all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of, of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. And there was no needy person amongst them, for all who were, um, owned land and houses would sell them and bring their possessions of the sales and, the, and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each as had need. And then you have the, the, um, uh, the example of Barnabas there. Actually, I think I skipped from time to time they would sell them. You don't do that for strangers. But you would do it in a household. If someone in your household had need, the rest would put together to sort it out. If so, you were. So they were close, they? Yeah. But there's the trust as well, because they mm -hmm. knew that they would go without. Yeah. Because they'd seen that others were surviving. Yeah. Now you can imagine when imagine the first day of Pentecost, 3,000 new believers, all of whom weren't going to just go strolling off to their home, they wanted to be together. Now when they met together, they met in the temple still, but they were meeting from house to house. And so people would be piling in in these different houses. And you'd have, the first churches were home groups, they were home, home churches. In fact, you don't have a proper, proper church building for hundreds of years to come. So these were homes, people were coming into your home. They become part of your family. And if it's part of your family, you'll see one person has virtually nothing and is starving, what do you do? You make sure they're fed. So when they went to house to house, this weren't have a little bit of bread and a little sip of wine. This was, here's a meal. Here's a meal. This is the law of hospitality. So, but how did they then? Hmm. Um, now we'll get onto that. It's on the other side of this sheet of paper. We'll get there. But there are problems. There are problems. And this is where the wine skin starts to stretch. Um, let's go to Thessalonians. Two Thessalonians. Because there, there is always a problem when you have freebies going, there's always somebody there who wants the freebies. And, 
Yeah. <coughs> Freebies are fine, but not when nobody else is. <laughs> yeah, somebody else's expense. Uh, someone want to read this one for me, please? Um, Two Thessalonians three six to fifteen. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after tradition which ye receive of us. For yourselves know how we ought to follow, how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread, for naught but walked with labour and travail night and day, that you might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when you were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For ye hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye with quietness, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well doing. And if any man obey not our word, by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Is fifteen? Yeah. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So where you have human beings, where you have freebies, we have the same with the, um, the, the um, welfare state in this country. The whole idea, starting from Christianity, quite mm -hmm. frankly, was there's people starving, we need to feed them. But as soon as there's free food going, haha, <laughs> I can sit back and do nothing. And they had that in the church. This is the wine skin being stretched. We won't look up the next one, but in Timothy, you have, um, they're talking about looking after widows. The, the Jewish, um, the widows and orphans, the Jewish teaching was you look after them. And the church was doing that. But the problem was there were some widows who were young enough to get remarried, young enough to work, young enough to be supporting themselves, who were, oh, I'm a widow, I'm sitting back now and being fed by the church, thank you. Going around from house to house, gossiping and causing problems. And Paul said, no. If they're going to be like that, let them go and get married again. Let them bring up children, let them do some work. Don't put them on the list and have people who are genuinely in need pushed off the list because they're on it. So the feminists don't like that one because they see Paul as being, he, he's talking here, he's talking about the men doing it, he's talking about the women doing it. Those people who are trying to get the freebies but not put the work in, not earn the bread by the sweat of their brow. And so he, he's trying to deal with that. Which is why in Acts obviously we have the first deacons being brought in. Because initially it was the apostles, the twelve apostles, receiving all this money coming in and having to go out and dish it out to the correct people. And as they said, we should be devoting ourselves to the word of God and to prayer, not waiting on tables. So that's why we had the first deacons being brought in, to try to, to be organised. Once again, this is the wine skin being pushed out. So they're... Yes, we want to feed people, especially as in Jewish society, if you become a Christian, you were chucked out of the synagogue. People wouldn't then trade with you. People who were just scraping by before suddenly would be in poverty. They needed to be fed, they needed to be looked after. This was the body of Christ, this is the household of Christ. We look after our own. We will look after them. And so this is the, the, the rules that have to start being moved around. Now if you turn over, on the first side, I had a, a more standard Jesus at the Last Supper, or what it probably really looks like. On the other side, you have your more typical arty Jesus at the Last Supper. Now, if you take a look at the top, there's some words there. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who has brought forth bread from the earth. That was the standard Jewish blessing um, when you broke bread. 
Imagine the first day of Pentecost. All these Christians are coming pouring in. They're coming into houses. And uh, the poor housewives are having to run around and get enough food for all these people. And they're, look, make more room, get another chair down. Come. They're getting all the people in. And imagine it's Peter. He's got the bread, he's going to bless it. What words does he say? Does he say the standard word? Or maybe it's something, Father, thank you that you've sent your son to die for us. That his body was broken on the cross. That his blood was shed for us. Now whether it happened on that day, whether it happened later on, at some stage, the last supper, the last Passover, was brought into these meals. And as to whether it was the blessing for the bread, whether it was a, a separate part of it, that aspect that we now call breaking of bread, communion, Eucharist, whatever, comes into these meals. And we know that um, because it's in Corinthians. If we go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, good old Corinthians, if you want to go wrong, that's the place you go to. <laughs> and therefore, therefore, Paul had to tell them to do it right, which is what we need to be told, quite frankly. So here's Corinthians, and they're talking about the same meals from household to household. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Mm. Since we are one bread, um, uh, since, we, since there is one bread, we, are, uh, we who are many are one body, for we are potatoes in the one bread. So here you can see that these meals they are having, that spiritual aspect has been brought in at some stage. Whether it was as early as Passover, uh, the first Pentecost I mean, it has been brought in and there is a spiritual aspect to these meals and they are sitting down and in some way that is a communion, in some way it's a remembrance of the Last Supper that has been brought into these practical meals. I'm going to read you. Bit of Homer. You all done your homework at school, didn't you? <laughs> this is a, a book about a um, rather dubious character called Odysseus, who got lost after the Trojan Wars. Um, this is early, early section in that they're trying to find Odysseus. He, he has unfortunately at this stage been shipwrecked on an island with an infomaniac goddess for seven years. And he is now... <laughs> And he's now discovering he can get too much of a good thing, but that's another matter. This is his son who is setting out to look for him. And you've got a goddess Athena who is working in the background organising things. The goddess Athena has now dressed herself up as a, an old advisor of Odysseus, a chap called Mentor. You heard the expression someone's mentor? That's where it comes from because he's, he's, he's the advisor to Odysseus. And now the goddess Athena is pretending to be a mentor and taking Odysseus's son in order to find him. And they're heading off, and they're going to end up at a feast. Right. Leaving the waters of the, split, uh, of the splendid east, the sun leaping up to the brazen firmaments to bring light to the to mortals and to mortal men on the fruitful earth, the travellers now came to Pylos, and stately, uh, the stately citadel of Nelos, and they found people on the foreshore sacrificing jet black bulls to Poseidon, lord of the earthquakes, god of the stable lock. And there were nine companies there. There were 500 men in each, and each company had nine bulls to sacrifice. And they had tasted the, um, and when they had tasted the victim's, victim's entrails, they were burning the thigh bones in the God's honor, as the travelers brought their, their trim ships to land. So that's the, the ships coming into land and they're seeing on the sea. This is the ship with Athena and um, Telemaeus, the son of Odysseus, coming into land and they see this big feast going on. Uh, a little bit further. Now, with Pallas Athena, this is the goddess dressed up as a man, um, led, led off quickly and Telemaeus followed in her steps of the goddess till they reached the palace where the people of Pylos were assembled. And there sat Nestor, the son and his sons, and their followers around them piercing meats with skewers and roasting them in preparation for the banquet. But as soon as they caught sight of the strangers, they all made a move in their direction. They took them by the hand and invited them in to join them. And Nestor and his sons, or Nestor's son was the first to reach them, and he took them both by the hand and he placed them at the banquet on downy fleeces and spread out on the sand where his brother and his father were. 
and he helped, um, helped them to the victims' inner parts, and filled golden cups with wine, and welcomed Pallas Athena, daughter of Zeus, who bears the Aegis, with these words. Pray to the gods, my friends, this feast that you find us holding is, uh, is in the Lord Poseidon's honour. And you have made your, uh, when you have made your drink offerings and your prayers and your rites and dedications, pass this cup of mellow wine onto your companion here, um, so that he may do the same. He too must be a worshipper of the immortal gods, of whom all men stand in need. But since he is the younger, in fact, a man of my own age, I hand the golden beaker um, to you first. The goddess was delighted at these good manners uh, that the young man showed, and giving her the, go the golden beaker first, and at once an earnest prayer to Lord Poseidon. Hear me, Poseidon, sustainer of the earth, and do not grudge us your, su your supplicants and the fulfilment of our wishes. First of all, grant glory to Nestor and his sons. Consider next these others, and recompense all in Pylos for this sumptuous offering. Grant lastly that Telemaeus and I may be successfully accomplish the task that brings us here in the swift black ships and put forward to reach home safely. And thus it goes on. In fact, most of this book is told at feasts um, because Homer was a teller of uh, stories at feasts. So what he would do is he would obviously pretend to be a character. And a lot of the story, if you read this, it's, not, it's told in retrospect by Odysseus or somebody at a feast. But you get the idea, the Greeks were big into feasts. If you look at the picture there, that is a picture of a symposium. You heard the word? Yeah, the original symposiums, which is getting together and talking about uh, important things and subjects, well, they could be Greeks getting together and talking about important subjects, or it could be Greeks getting together and having a party. We had a symposium in the house next to us last night. It went on to about one o'clock, and they were obviously having a symposium with a um, karaoke bar. <laughs> and at most of these symposiums, most of these feasts, the the, the, sac the thing that was killed wouldn't be just going on the butcher and buy it. It would be a sacrifice. It would be a sacrifice to this god or that god. So when Christianity moved from the Jewish world, who had the theory of the Passover and everything else, that they, they, they had these ideas, it came over to the Greek world where they also had ideas, but completely differently. Do you notice the, the symmetry between some of that and Abraham? Along come these guests. Guests, come in, sit down, I'll get you some food. Um, with the Greeks, and that, they believed, I think, that Zeus had the law of hospitality as well, yeah. and he was very big on that. And they also have a note with that thing, Athena and Poseidon hated each other, which was very hilarious with blessing. <laughs> it actually goes on to say that Athena made it happen rather than Poseidon. Um, but, but you have this idea, here's, here's these people, one of whom is a god, is coming and sat down and have this feast. Abraham, one of the, these people, come in, sit down, one of whom is God. Have a feast. Now that all sounds good, except the problem is, when you take the Jewish one and put it into a Gentile world, what happens? All the Gentile stuff gets linked in. Let's go to Corinthians. Oh, we're still in Corinthians, actually. Uh, 10, chapter 10. And you can see the problem of the, the, the Greek world coming into the, the Jewish world now and affecting what um, the Bible calls love, agape meals, love feasts, the way it affects them. Um, so 10, someone want to read this for me? Oh, it was a long one, sorry. Uh, Corinthians 1, 10, 19 to 33. What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the thing which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbour. 
eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking a question, for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the unbelievers invites you and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking question, for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the conscience sake. I mean not your own conscience, but the other man's, for why is my freedom judged by another one's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whether then you eat or drink, or whether you do, do all, whatever you do, all to the glory of God. Give no offence either to Jew or to the Greek, or to the church of the God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. Thank you. In a Greek market, there will be some meat on sale. You don't know if that meat was actually sacrificed to a god and they flogged off the spare bits to the butcher. In fact, what often they would do is they would take it and give it to their local priests, who would hang it up for a while outside there, there was an offering, and then they would take it down to the local meat market. Um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons um, that the Jews changed the, the, the word Beelzebul, they changed it to Beelzebub. Beelzebul means Lord of the Royal House. Beelzebub means Lord of the Flies. And the reason was because all this meat was hung outside, outside these temples mm. with all the flies on it. Mm. And so they sort of took the mickey out of it. Um, what Paul is saying is, look, they can offer this meat to an idol. Physically, that meat's the same. Spiritually, yeah, the idol's a, a demon they're offering it to. Mm. If you give thanks for that meat, spiritual, the spiritual side is taken off. If you give thanks to it, to God, who gave it to you in the first place. It wasn't the idols who gave it to you, it was God who gave it to you. Yeah. You can think that the spiritual side of that's gone. But, but, but. If a younger Christian looks at you and sees you going into a, a feast to Zeus, they're going to think, oh, that's all right. Mm. I can worship Zeus and worship God and I can add them together and I can mix the two together. Yeah. And he said, no, you can't do that. Yes, it's clear it's safe to eat, but you've got to think of the other person, not yourself. So they've got, they had these meals, they had the agape meals, but so did the, the pagans. And Paul was having this problem with the two sections meeting together and overlapping and getting confused. And so he gives solutions here. And there's another aspect here. If we go over to uh, 11, 1 Corinthians 11, you see, the Greek, the Greek festivals, it wasn't a nice genteel sharing. It was you get in there, you get as much and you get as drunk as you can in a shorter time possible. I think officially drunkenness was not looked upon wonderfully, but nonetheless it was there. In the Jewish literature, it is frowned upon. It was there, but it was frowned upon. Even at the end of the Passover meal, I think a lot of people were fairly, fairly half cut because they drink quite a bit on that. So even now, yeah, they have these cups of wine, this goes on for hours, so this is a big meal, and by the end of it, the adults would be, well, rolling home at night. Which is why they had a bit of problems the finding... Were sleepy. Yeah, a bit sleepy. <laughs> Which is why they had a bit of problem trying to find enough people to try Jesus. <coughs> it took them a while to get enough people who were sober enough to come in and actually to try Jesus on the Passover night. <coughs> but here's Paul trying to route out some of the problems that they were getting in the Gentile world that was coming in and mucking up these feasts. Um, so I say 11, 20. 20. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to, you are not, to, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each takes his own supper first. And the one who is hungry, um, and the one who is hungry, and the other is drunk. What? Do you, uh, do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Do you despise the church of God and put to shame those who have nothing? What shall I say? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. 
For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, the Lord, on the night which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given it, given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is, which you, um, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and drink the bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself first so that he may eat and drink um, of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, of the, drinks judgment upon himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many amongst you are weak, sick, and a number are asleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we, are not, not, we will not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together, uh, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you may not come together for judgment. And this remain, the remainder of this matter I shall arrange when I come. There's a change here. You notice it's no longer to feed the hungry. It, it's, a, it's a symbolic meal. And it's to be done in a set way. Which is why we now have a set way we do it in the church. It's no longer a meal when we're all sitting down to eat. Now there's a bit in there that I, I'm always interested in. Um, you eat and drink condemnation on yourself. What do you think that means? You need to recognise the body of Christ. Yes. What do you think it means? Well, you need to take it seriously that it mm. is. So if, if we don't, if the person who's eating and drinking doesn't take it seriously, does that mean that God smites them down? Or might do? That's what it's saying. Mm. That's how I've thought of it. That's how the church has often thought of it. But as I was reading this, I realised there's something else possibly. Now, there is a case that God will smite you down. Um, we won't look it up. The breach of Azar. Can you remember what that is? Any of you heard that expression before? This is David was bringing the ark from where it was up to Jerusalem. And he put it on a cart. And the cart rocked wildly. And the, the boy Azar held it out to grab hold of it. And God smote him down and killed him. Because he touched the ark. The ark's a symbol of the presence of God. And there was rules about that symbol. He grabbed that symbol. Now whether it was because he was really concerned. Or whether he got sloppy about it because it had been in his house for ages. Whatever it is, God killed him. So you can get killed for mishandling a symbol. But. Think of. Maybe you shouldn't have struck the rock twice. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. That's why he's moving into the so if, the, if communion, as we have it, is a symbol, and we have to make sure that we treat that symbol properly, what about the Borgia popes who were killing people left, right and centre, and yet every day they were having mass? What about the child abusing priests in this country? Yes. Every day they were doing mass. Mm -hmm. Did God smite them down? Mm -hmm. Or the um, super high um, uh, evangelical tele-preachers who were swindling people left, right and centre who were doing communion. Mm. Did God smite them down? No. But he will judge them. Oh, he will judge them. Oh, yes. He will judge them. But they're not, they're not ill. No. They're not sick. No. Let's look up Lazarus. Go to Luke. But not the Lazarus you're thinking of. Go to Luke. <coughs> In some ways, I think this is more of a condemnation of the church than simply an individual who's not really believing what they're saying when they're eating the bread. So Luke 16, it's verse 19. There was a certain rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linens and gay living and splendour every day, and a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gates covered in sores mm -hmm. and longing to be fed the crumbs that were falling from under the rich man's table. Besides, even, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. And it came about when the poor man died, he was carried to Abraham, by angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. 
People in this church were getting drunk. They were grabbing more food. But there were other people who were starving. Because actually Paul says that there's people who are hungry and you're eating too much. When I look at this, I, I, yes, okay, mishandling a symbol, but this is something practical. This is supposed to be a feast to make sure nobody's hungry, to make sure everybody's fed. It's now become a feast where some people are drunk, some people have stuffed themselves, other people are starving. There's people in your church who are starving to death. There's people who are ill. Because you are doing it wrong. That to me is more of a condemnation. A symbol, yes, God will judge that symbol. But if we allow someone to starve to death or to be ill, and we don't give them the help that a household should give to that person, that's a condemnation and a half. Whether I'm right or wrong in that, I don't know. But as I was reading it, that's what came out to me, looking at these other things. And if we go to Jesus' word in Matthew 24. Matthew 24. I'm going on too long again today, I do apologise. And it's Jesus talking about a household, the rule of a household, his own household. Who then is a faithful and sensible slave whom his master puts in charge of the household to give them their food in the proper times? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds doing so when he comes. Truly I say unto you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if the evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for, for long, and he should begin to beat his fellow slaves and to eat and drink and be drunken, the master of that slave will come when he does not expect him and in an hour that he does not know, and he will cut him in pieces and assign his place with the hypocrites and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That seems to me to fit in with that idea of the church should be feeding the poor people in its midst. I want to finish off with a, possibly the most famous word on bread in the Bible. It's from Deuteronomy, Jesus' favourite book, and he quotes it himself. Hopefully you all know what it is already. Yeah. Deuteronomy 8. The, the whole idea of this, there is two elements to this breaking of bread. There's the spiritual element and there's a physical element. And we cannot, we cannot get them both, we've got to get them both right. We've got to get them both set. I mean in this church we've separated off the, the spiritual element. But also you've got the food bag. We're still feeding. Hopefully we're still picking up those within the fellowship who need it. But every church has to have a system, has to have a way of looking after the household as well as doing the spiritual side of things. Let's go to Jim. The words of Moses which Jesus quoted to Satan. All the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do and live and multiply and go to possess the land which the Lord swore, swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the ways which the Lord God has led you in the wilderness for these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart and whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry. He fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, everything that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Anyway, we'll end on that note. Father, thank you that you have made us part of your household. Thank you, Lord, that you broke your son on the cross for us. And that as we eat that one loaf, we become part of his one body. Lord, help us to, to be good servants, to be good slaves. Help us to see those who need our help. Those who are suffering in the world. And in our fellowships. Nor that we may bring your love, your agape to them. 
and help support them in this world. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Very absolutely short, shared, yeah. Yeah. shared biscuits. <laughs> I suppose if I were any good, I would have broke them and passed them all around. You know. So. Thank you, everybody.